Hi guys and welcome to another video from us here in Swindon, myself and Debbie. How are you getting on, Debbie? Hello. Hi. I'm okay. How are you this evening, Martin? Okay? Because you've had a you've had a day with the media, haven't you, today? Or I a morning have. with the media? Yes, the BBC um been interviewing me on a topic actually we're about to cover now, which is the NHS. Now we know this has been a hot topic. Um um, well, most general elections, I, I feel quite often the NHS is used as a political football. Um, mm. Debbie, when when people mention the NHS, what, what kind of first springs to your mind? You want the truth? <laughs> yeah, well, of course you do. We're, we're, tr we're so-called truthers, as they, they call us. Yeah, the first, I'm not, I'm not going to say the answer that's the answer for the electorate. I'm going to say the answer what I really think. Mm. If you'd have asked me 10 years ago, I would have been proud. I would have said, yeah, the NHS is, is a wonderful thing. Now, I'm, I'm quite ashamed of what our NHS is turning into. Um, ashamed, concerned, um, and I have to say, in some ways, a little bit disgusted at, at, at how it's been used against us, the population. So that, that yeah. Um, I'm not saying, just to be very clear, because obviously someone will take that and say, oh, she thinks that doesn't apply to all of the NHS. There's, there's wonderful, there's still really good parts of it and good experiences people have and that I've had and some amazing staff, but overall, I just feel that's what it's it's turning into. I think so. Yeah. I mean, the staff have been absolutely amazing, actually, um, for anyone who goes up there, treated with um, such um, kindness and compassion. A Swindon Hospital. Yeah, I mean, and we'll come to the point about why I've, I feel, you know, it's turning into this awful thing now. I mean, Swindon Hospital, funnily enough, because I used to live in Gloucestershire, and Gloucester was our, our nearest hospital, now I'm in, in Wiltshire. My experience going to Swindon Hospital, which is my nearest hospital, um, has actually been really quite positive. I have to say I found the staff there really, um, really, really helpful. Um, you know, there's no sort of judgments about how they treat people. You all treat, seem to be treated mm. the same. And yeah, I've had a, a good experience there, actually, Martin. I have to say, it's, um, despite all the problems that obviously I just mentioned, um, the staff, yeah. and I'm sure that's the, the same for the vast majority, seem to be holding up really well those on the front line just do a phenomenal job day in day out you know keeping us um keeping us safe and as we know there are many um, um different nationalities that work for the nhs as well and we thank all of them now one of the yeah. issues well i i imagine has been talked about a lot is um we keep hearing that the nhs is underfunded um this was brought mm. up earlier when i spoke to the bbc i have yeah. to say I don't think it's been underfunded at all. I'm going to I'm going to stick my head above the parapet here and say this, because mm. it has never ever been so well funded. The amount of money that's been pushed into it, um, it's beyond its highest ever level. I think yeah. what we're seeing is though, because if you think about it, did, I, bet, I don't know if you know this, but the NHS is the fifth um, largest employer in the world. Just just think about that for a minute. In the world, the fifth uh, largest. It's... You know, and there's still over a hundred thousand vacancies that haven't been filled. It doesn't matter how much money you got, you cannot um, throw money to fix that. It's clearly a staffing crisis, and this is why um, I don't know if you agree, Debbie, but I certainly advocate to reintroduce the nurses' bursary for one thing that was removed, yeah. Um, yeah. and of course, junior doctors should be supported better, give them a better salary. Yeah. And yeah. um, we should also be encouraging a fair immigration system so we get the the, the staff here that we need. Because what um, yeah. people don't seem to understand is we've got 1.2 million people um, coming here each year. Net immigration, 625,000. The vast majority of those aren't doctors or nurses. And that is in turn putting pressure um, on the NHS. Um, what do you think, Debbie? Yeah, I think you're right. I think, um, I th and funnily enough, I've been talking to, on, a, on an unrelated point, the, the WASPI women, the, the women against the state pension, what they call inequality, where the women born in the 50s um, lo have lost part of that pension entitlement, and they've been fighting for it. And I was talking to them today, and the, this exact same point came up but with that issue about whether it's immigration, and I agree with you, whether it's older people being forced into the job market because they can't get their pension the way they used to or it's been um, held off um, 
or wh whatever it is, or whether it's young people being brought in to do jobs, it's it's uh, all different groups have kind of been brought into the job market, I think, including immigrants, to play us all up against each other in terms of this, what I call drive to the bottom. Mm. Drive to the bottom drives wages down, and it actually drives standards down as well, because I think, I haven't got the figures, Martin, but lots of staff in the NHS now are agency workers, as you know, mm. which they bring in for all the kind of, how can I put it, you know, all the, you know, the nursing, uh, midwifery, um, all the other departments, not just the doctors, you know, all the other departments as well, um, sort of cleaning, all that kind of is, is under contract. And I just think this is just, and I would imagine that a large number of those that work for agencies are obviously economic migrants as well. Um, and I just think it's this drive, I call it the drive to the bottom. It's just driven down mm. wages Yep. It's casualized work, and I think also, I mean, I've done it, used to do agency work some quite some years ago, mm. and that's exactly your experience as an agency worker as well. You see that side of it. You're treated like dirt yes. um, as an agency <laughs> worker. You've got no stability. Of course, if you're treated that way, let's be honest, Martin, you're not really going to be completely committed to your job, and you're not going to be that enthusiastic. And I think when you've got an NHS that's working in that way where doctors, nurses, mm. professionals are constantly being undermined in that way and played off. There's this horrible, yeah. and I've been told this by NHS staff, there's this horrible culture in the NHS of competition mm. and um, division. Yeah. And of course, of course, people are getting angry if they're not being paid properly. So yeah, yeah. It, that has to change. Using agencies, in my opinion, we've got to stop. They've got to stop using agency staff in the NHS. I, I think yeah. there has to be, or at least, a huge reduction at the very least, because I just think, you know, I understand there might be an argument that if someone's off sick yeah. or something, you need to bring an agency staff. But let's think back to the old NHS. They used to cope. They would have a system mm. of people that would pick up the shifts or the work to cover people that yeah. were absent. So I think that we we don't have to rely no. on agency on agency staff and in all honesty i don't think it's even about that it's just about undercutting all the time and it is but it actually yeah. this this is the madness about it it doesn't actually save any money no <laughs> it well, costs more it doesn't yeah. no but we know who's so, probably yeah. making money out of it like those also with the um with those contracts for the um ppe and stuff um sadly the nhs gets massively abused but i think that's a good point you raise actually that race to the bottom i mean a lot of these mm -hmm. um, agency staff as well they're just treated um like slave labor basically i mean yeah. they bring these people in because they know they can get away with giving them rubbish money because they don't have to yeah. um, pay british nationals and of course these poor yeah. staff who work really hard really really hard probably living in a bed set in a, a multiple house of occupancy or something just trying to get yeah. by and they they've got no rights or nothing and they're, they're treated like absolute dirt i mean in some sort of ways this is kind of like modern slavery in a way or just trying to, to say and, and it has a detrimental effect on our um on our rights to work which is understandable why people get angry um and i and i think and this is not any way me pointing the finger at those people that take those jobs because it's understandable mm. why they do it but also, I think it drives standards down, Martin, because yes. if you've got a constant flow of, of workers that are not permanent, you've got no way of building up a system of standards and efficiency and checking that it's being done properly. And I've, se I've seen that all my years in education. It's exactly the same process that goes on when you've got schools, colleges, co using loads of agency staff, which they do. It's exactly the same thing, mm. things that ch kids or students are not taught properly mm. because it's it's the same thing isn't it it's like if you've got a nurses that know their department and are working there all the time yeah they they know how it works they know what to do they know how to deal with situations but when you've got people coming in that are coming and going you're never going to get that no so it, it's interesting it, yeah. actually, um um i heard about um there used to be matrons on the wards as well and then they kept yeah. like the place like um really clean and there was a good, um, um, lack, well, a good amount of discipline there. Um, yeah, here, yeah really that's true. Slipping, yeah. slipping behind. Bit it. of a kind of a, a sort of a, an image in our history, isn't it? The image mm. of the matron, which is sort of the butt of jokes. But yeah, it was this kind of authoritative figure, wasn't it, that made sure things were done mm. properly. 
and uh, yeah, I, I think bring back the uh, the matrons yeah. absolutely. And um, I think you know we we really need to seriously think about you know, looking at the uh, the NHS because you know they want to privatise it. Make no mistake about that. We do not want that. It should be a service fit for everyone. But it needs massive, massive amount of change, you know. Absolutely, because... it needs it taking back to to the, the basics of the, the beginning, you know, and sort of starting again to restructure it. Um, in my opinion, the private finance initiative, which is, I would say, you know, well over fifty percent gone to the private, gone mm. private anyway. Martin, it's just the charges haven't kicked in yet. I think that's coming down the line, to mm. be honest. Um, I think that private finance initiative, which is actually costing three times over, if you look at the statistics yes. of, of our money, three times over, we're having to pay for what if, as as we talked about earlier, if you bring things back in house, whether it's your staff, whether it's your supplies, um, you know, it, it it it's cheaper. Yeah. So it's not just it's not just about having more people to deal with because mm. that's always the the reason that's given. It's actually about just, just getting rid of all that money that's just going to top executives, exactly. going to companies, um, all, all, all that kind of thing. As, yeah. Well, check this figure out then. Over 55,000 NHS staff earn over 100,000 a year. That is sorry, fi sorry, say that, 50,000. 55, over 55,000 NHS staff earn over 100,000 a year. That is some serious dough there. That is serious dough. Um, yeah, and of course, um, they, and who are they? They executives, I'm guessing, or managers, exactly. and they're not the frontline workers, the ones actually um, no. um, saving people's lives on the front line. You know, these are people above that um, don't see anything like that. You know, that's no. why the whole thing needs restructuring. Yeah. You know, and you mentioned junior doctors. I haven't looked recently at what their starting salary was, but I remember looking at it a couple of years, two or three years ago, and it was something. It was around twenty thousand pounds a year, mm. I think. It might have slightly increased now, but I mean, which is shocking when you think of what they've yeah. got to do. They're the heroes. And the, on the what they line. go through. They are the true heroes there. Those those, um, those men and women, the doctors and nurses, actually seeing face to face mm. um, patients. Yeah. They're the ones that should be on uh, over £100,000, in my um, humble opinion. Absolutely, absolutely. But, you know, we talked about the NHS and, you know, we, we said at the beginning what comes into my mind. I mean, the reason I said, you know, I feel it's it's turning into something awful is because I feel, and I am going to mention the, the lockdown and what happened with hospitals, because obviously people will know that I did, you know, people will know that if they, they Google my name or, or if you know me and you're listening, um, that I did take my camera around the corridors. Very bravely, I may add. Mm. To, show, to show how quiet, I mean, it was almost empty to show people that they were not getting that essential care, which is why I did it. That's what it was about. They were not getting the care that they needed. Mm. And I knew then, as we're seeing now, that this would create a, a huge backlog and create more health problems that would cause the crisis we've got now with waiting lists and all the rest of it. It's contributed to that. But the point I'm going to make is the reason that I, that I said that I'm, I, I'm sort of quite disgusted at where it's going is because I feel that the NHS has turned into a cash cow for the big pharmaceutical companies. Yeah. And I think the the lockdown and the way it was handled was a huge, was evidence of that. It, it really was. And I and I just feel I'm, I'm quite ashamed to think, you know, that institution that I said, you know, just 10 years ago, I was I was like, this is this is a wonderful thing. It's like it's been turned into a monster. Mm. And I you know and, and these let's be honest these pharmaceutical companies they're not interested as as we know they're not interested in standards or people's safety or ethics it's just profit and i think power as well mm. that that comes into what's yeah. these companies that the nhs are working with so i think you're absolutely right there and that has to change. It, it just has to. We have to go back to basics. And Absolutely. sorry, that stuff sounds like John Major in the nineties, doesn't it? We have to go back to back to scratch, if you like, and and, and start again. Well, yeah. we do, just like our whole political system, which is why we run as independents. But you know, we need to look at this seriously. We can't keep throwing money at the problem. There's more to it than that. And like you said, it's turned into yeah. some sort of monster. Um, yeah. Where there's too much dead weight. It's being exploited too much. Money being siphoned off here, there, everywhere. Um, like you yeah. mentioned before, we should be taking pharmaceuticals back in house, creating these things. Absolutely, I think honestly, I think as long as it's 
managed publicly and, and not by mm -hmm. anybody with vested interests, which is the problem with the way the NHS is run, um, I, I think it would be safety and ethics would, would come come into it a lot. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, and it'd be a lot cheaper. Once again, it would be a lot cheaper. Yeah, um, absolutely. How much money? I mean, I don't know if you've got that figure to hand. How many billions were spent on, you know, using all these pharmaceutical products mm. during the lockdown? Uh, not just not just vaccines. Obviously, we're not going to get into that debate here. But all the, um, as we've seen, all the scandals of the PPE contracts as well, exactly. and all the people that had their their noses in the trough, you know, it, uh, over that, um, yeah, making money out exactly. of that. So. It, it will be just so much cheaper. We we save money on all these mm. counts we're talking about, and it's all is it just me, Martin? It's just like this is just common sense stuff. Mm. What we're talking about, we're not experts. I'm yeah. no means an expert on the NHS or what goes on. It's just, yeah, it's just no one seems to be talking common sense about this stuff. I mean, yeah, it, it, it's they, they're always putting distractions in, just saying I'll throw more money at it. But the problem is. That money's just getting siphoned off to where it shouldn't be going, you know. And we are the, you know, it's it's not a charity, you know. It's funded by us, the taxpayer. It always has yeah. been, you know. And we're not yeah. getting perhaps the value of the money that we should do. You know, I've always no. argued perhaps it should be running a more military operation, but you know, yeah, it's, it's just it has turned into something that's unrecognisable. And it, you know, yeah. many countries um, envy us for this thing. You know, that's why we get lots of health tourists. But it's yeah. been abused far too much now. So, you know, this is why it's important um, to support uh, mm -hmm. people like um, Debbie and myself so we can go into Parliament and raise these issues, start talking about them and start picking yeah. this apart. Because um, it's gone too far now because it, it will just collapse if we um, if we don't. Um, um, I think it will. And, it. And, to, and, to, and I think that's a really important point is I hate to say this, but I think it will be a planned collapse as well in the sense mm -hmm. of they will then say it's the perfect way to bring in charges. They will then yeah. say, well, the only way you're going to get this operation done or this is that we're going to have to start bringing in charges, which I'm surprised hasn't happened already, actually. I think yeah. it's it's very close. Um, and also the reason that hasn't happened for all those out there that are very sceptical of campaigning and public, you know, how it affects public opinion is, is they know that that would upset so many people so that yeah. they've been very careful, I think, in, in doing that. Um, but I do think it, it's coming. Um, and you've got to think the amount of people that are going to be excluded yeah. from... It's time it'll be like got involved, really, and um, started um, dealing with this in a, in a sensible manner so we can preserve it for another, um, is it 70 plus years? Yeah. But yeah. anyway, exactly. yeah. if anyone yeah, from Swindon, anyone in the NHS got any questions about that please feel free to reach out um to debbie and i you know maybe yeah. you see things that we don't see you know the internal yeah. workings will keep that a complete confidence you know so yeah. we need your help to look at these the, these issues as well i know um i've yeah. been approached by um nhs staff in the past and um, it's been a real eye-opener so if you if mm. you can do just keep us updated and let us know yeah, I think that's really important. And and to add on to that message, because I've had so much lies and horrible stuff printed about me about yeah. obviously filming those corridors, or I didn't do anything to to anybody or, or no. say anything offensive to anybody, which is what I was, I was charged with. Is can I just please underline? And I even said that in that video, and that's been completely ignored because of the propaganda around me. Mm. The reason I did it is because at that time I felt very strongly, and I, I care about the NHS. Always have done as a campaigner. Um, and I could see what it was being used for. It was being used to eventually undermine all of you and your jobs, put, put it into a crisis mm. by creating a backlog, among other things, and creating more health problems for people. And also, you know, the, the systems that kicked in at that time that were very digitalized, as we talked about before in another way, Martin, you know, everything sort of turned online, didn't it, in terms mm. of healthcare during um, the, the lockdown. And that, if you look at what Matt Hancock was planning at the time, and he was planning that before the lockdown, if you look into um, Department of Health briefings and policies, was about digitalising the NHS um, so that we can't have so much one-to-one -one contact, whether it's with a GP, uh, whether it's you know going in on outpatients appointments, where it'll be done online or on the phone. 
and with these companies having the contracts and that was part of that phasing in which is what they which is why it's impossible for you to get an appointment with your doctors at the moment it's impossible so it's um exactly. I, you know i could see that was coming down the line i could see it was part of this bigger agenda of, of um decon say deconstructing like, that's not the word destroying mm. destroying the nhs yeah plan destruction no, that's a very good point yeah. right well we'll leave it there then but um yeah hopefully um you agree with them uh, debbie and i and our thoughts and how we can tackle this massive problem and of course feel <laughs> please feel free to reach out to us we'll, we've still got a few more weeks of campaigning as you know debbie is standing in the north and swindon i'm standing in the south um we've been getting amazing amazing feedback out on the streets um mm. people really pleased but to we, see us we need you to vote for us not just support us <laughs> you've right. got to register to vote by next tuesday the 18th and that's the only way is you're going to make a difference is to come and vote for us so um, yeah, that's a good message yeah. thanks everyone for listening and we'll be back soon for another yeah. discussion take yeah. care okay bye bye